Yes. It's, uh, if you've, uh, I mean, that's what the media taught me. Like, you come up with the title first and make it like really short and snappy and fun, and then you're like, okay, what am I going to talk about? You know, that's it. So, uh, Francesco, lock the door, please. So this is what I'm going to talk about. No. <laughs> So my name is Hjalti Hjalmarsson. I come from Iceland. I'm an animator. Uh, <laughs> bless you, yes. My name is Hjalti Hjalmarsson. Uh, you may call me whatever you want. <laughs> I'm an animator from Iceland originally. Uh, I've just recently moved here. And uh, I've been working as an animator for a few years and dabbled with it before that. Uh, so I guess I show you my show reel. It's a little bit outdated, by the way. I don't have any sound. Oh. Oh. How do I do the sound thing? Oh. I need plug and play. <laughs> Turning off the lights didn't help, I guess. Okay. okay. Oh, yes, headphones, please. Okay. Try it. Wow. Hi, my 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 name is Michelle, and I am a. Well. I just need to prove to my wife that I can act like a man. And it's not about sex. I don't just lie there if that's what you're thinking. No way, Mega Vika. Oh, Mega Mother and Creeper go crunching as in a glow walker. Go pop a mappy, I'll dominus. It's like going on a date with a chatty Kathy doll. I expect to have a little string on your chest, you know, that I pull out and have to snap back. Except I wouldn't pull it out and snap it back. You would. <laughs> Yay! I want the lights on. So, okay, um... I'm gonna kind of go over a lot of different topics, and the problem is I just started overloading the presentations with too many topics. I could just pick one and just take a do a whole hour-long presentation just on one topic. But uh, I want to tackle this also just from the perspective of somebody that wants to get started into animation and wants to do something like this, like you know, not coming on this in particular, but some kind of animation-related stuff that's like, oh, that's happy and funny and it looks simple and then you start doing it and it looks like shit and then you start like reading about animation it's like oh shit there's a lot of rules and principles and stuff and I'm here to tell you that like 
all this stuff is important because uh, people started out basically as you did a long time ago, and they came upon all these different hurdles. And they moved past them, they, like, like a lot of trial and error, of course. But they came up with these principles, and there's a reason for each one of, each one of them. Now, they can totally be broken, but you first have to understand why they're there, and then why you would want to break them. Uh, why they're there, because of this thing. So like, <laughs> great drawing, by the way, right? It's just like middle of the night, real fast. OK. So that, if you, if you look at the cartoon, and this applies also to filmmaking in general, but I'm going to stick to like our animation. Uh, it's an interplay between the brain and its inputs and whatever like we're trying to output to it. Now, if we were to do animation in like five dimensions and ultraviolet, why? Like it, that's not what the target audience is for. So if I talk, this is the vegetables before the candy. So like this is a little bit, I, I want to preface this by saying this is important, but you know, it's a wall of text. So I'm just going to briefly go over it. There's a lot of stuff there. There, like uh, the brain itself is kind of this delusion bubble, and it's trying to make sense of what it's seeing and hearing and all that. Uh, just for for an example, um, uh, the area in which an eye would see totally in focus is the size of a fingernail in arms, arm's length. The rest is just the brain trying to make it seem like it's all in focus. Now, when you're doing any kind of animation, for example, you have to kind of like at least be aware of that because that means that you can't have two awesome simultaneous actions going on at the same time, like on like opposite end of the screen. That's just not going to register. So you have to think about like a focal point is going over the screen, and of course in time. Yeah, and 24 frames per second, which is kind of arbitrary. Uh, it it the 24 frames per second came because of the end of the silent era. Because before that, audio wasn't really that important. And the brain kind of, it can adjust to different uh, frame rates. And they used to have uh, hand cranked film projectors. And they would slow down and speed up. So anything from like 22 frames per second to 26. And then when the audio came and had to be hooked up to it, uh, the brain wasn't that forgiving. Like stuff had to, like it couldn't go up and down in frequency or whatever. So they just settled on 24 frames per second. So it is kind of arbitrary, but that's like the goal we've set ourselves to at least learn the trade. Now, you could wrap this up to like, you know, 60 frames per second or whatever, and it's not going to get lost on the brain because it can, it can cognitively perceive uh, different frames per second up to like 150. It, it, it's going to depend on the person, of course, but it's, the point is it's not a waste. Everything above 150, yeah, that's probably going to be a waste. Um, pareidolia, that's one of my favorite things. Uh, it's, the, <clears throat> it's the tendency in the brain to, see, uh, to create a pattern out of random visual or auditory uh, random stimuli. So this, this also applies to other senses, of course, but it's, it's more profound or big in, 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 uh, in the vision and in hearing, like phantom uh, cell phone ringing. You know that? Like, there's actually a study on that. So like, people will like think that your cell phone is vibrating when it's not. And it's like, oh. And it was just because like, uh, the brain is just hooked up to that area so much and trying to be really sensitive to the thing that whenever there's any kind of small vibration, it's like, oh, yeah, that, that's definitely a call. That's my girlfriend. OK. <laughs> so, and that applies to a lot of different things regarding like uh, audio or video. Um, for example, uh, when, you, when you draw like two, uh, two spots and then a line, we're going to see kind of a face out of it. And then we can add the complexity to it. We can go all the way to like really hyper-realistic eyes and a mouth shape and a nose and everything. But it's the brain doing the heavy lifting. I mean, that, it's kind of, it's just a drawing. It's a flat drawing. It's, there's not a person there. But it's telling us that there's a person there. Uh, this also applies to other things like, you know, seeing Jesus on a toast. So, you know, like, you know, take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> Could be a good thing, bad thing. I don't know. Uh, with audio, uh, it's really normal for us in our environment is that video always go, I mean, of course, uh, light travels faster than speed of sound. So, so if there's any kind of lag going on, the audio has to be lagging. You can't have the audio going through before. So if you ever have that, like,
like if you have that, ever had that moment you're editing your animation or doing something or lip syncing or whatever, and you're like, okay, it's like that sound is going like half that frame. You know, it's better to make the audio lag, not the, not the animation itself. Uh, there's a fuzzy line where the brain is like, okay, like if I'm one frame behind the audio, it's still gonna be like this brain is still gonna mask that. And it's gonna feel like, oh, there's no lag at all. Two frames, it's gonna be kind of iffy. Three frames for me is like way too much. Uh, for normal people, it can go max three frames. Anything above that, I mean, it's just insane. I mean, uh, people won't stand for it. Uh, I'm just gonna keep going. There's a lot of stuff I gotta, I gotta push through, push through. Um, so this is one I wanna, this is one of the topics I wanna, I wanna talk about a little bit. Um, so uh, I, I got the cookie flex rig, courtesy of blendercookie.com. Check it out. Um, so this is the way the, the, the model of the rig uh, came to me, just like if it, it, it's the default values. And I, the, a lot of problem I see with uh, brand new animators is that they just start using it right away and take this as if it's a relaxed pose. But it isn't. It's, it's the pose that the modeler did to do a better topology and then the rigger did that made kind of sense, you know, it's like regarding the rig. So what I would recommend just when you're starting out, just move everything slightly. I mean, you can see like I'm relaxing the face a little bit, I'm, I'm moving down the eyebrows a little bit and the eyelids. Just don't put your starting point in this weird T pose thing. Like start, start off with the resting pose and that, like, that kind of fits the character and then go from there. A lot of stuff I'm gonna talk about is really general. There's a bell curve and there's exceptions to everything. So just have that caveat when you ask, like when you start asking questions, you're like, well, everything you said is not valid because of this one exception. Yeah, there's, there's, there's exceptions, yes, I know. So what I wanna demonstrate a little bit of, about facial expressions is uh, the rookie errors, the newbie errors. The, and I'm totally guilty of this when I was starting out in animation. It's uh, facial, it's like not really adjusting to what the anatomy, underlying anatomy is, and doing just these crazy facials that are not gonna register properly. And like, it's hard for humans to actually mimic them. Uh, I had some volunteers <laughs> to work on that. If that slide ever pops up, yep, there we go. And back, and forth. There we go, okay. So, I just really wanted to show that slide. That's the volunteers. Adorable, adorable. Okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> wow, brand new computer and it's lacking like hell. All right. Good stuff, good stuff, okay. So with the first one, uh, can anybody like tell me what's wrong with the first one? Uh, it looks looks normal. Yeah, of course. Well, the the eyebrows should be connected. That's the thing. The underlying anatomy is that the eyebrows can't be disconnected like that. There's just no way. And it's it's one of those things where like people just love like breaking them without thinking about like the underlying anatomy to it. And it it feels weird. And adorable faces. I know. I know. <laughs> So, super happy, but the eyebrows are come, like, they're, they're really high. I could have even pushed it further. And you can see the, the, like, bottom half of the face, all the flesh that's there. Let's say you have a smile and you push up those, uh, those mouth corners. That's going to push up the flesh in the cheekbones, like, uh, surrounding the cheekbones. And that's going to push up the lower eyelids. There's, it's really hard to mimic this, where, like, you have a heavy smile, but your eyelids are really low. Uh, there's, no way of doing it. I, I keep seeing this. Okay, angry. Uh, so the end of the eyelid, the uh, end of the eyebrows, uh, they don't, they barely move. So if you go up and down like crazy expressions, they barely move like a millimeter. So you have to, uh, and by the way, that rig didn't allow me to do that. So I had to, <laughs> I had to cheat my way into that funky little thing. Uh, also the, like, yeah. The rest of the face is kind of weird, but it, this is a rookie mistake I see all the time. No, oh, cute. Here's another kind of smug face. Uh, there's like it's it's better than the other one, but there's still an underpinning problem with it. Uh, the problem is that the, if you look at the top half of the face and then lower half, the top face is going in one direction, 
and the lower half is going in the same direction. And it's really hard to do that. Uh, like you could do it, but you would have to put effort into it. What's more natural is that if one half here like is going down, the other, don't take pictures. <laughs> Come on. The other half is going to push up against it. So it's going to squish this half, and the other half is going to come up. Uh, so if I just show you like really quickly, like because these are fairly similar, I just did like a generic one. So the, the top ones are the ones that are kind of bad, like rookie mistakes. And the lower ones that are ones that I did that are like kind of kind of ad, uh, adequate. Um, and you can see the different things that are wrong with oh, Sorry, beer coming up. Uh, so you see, like. For example, if you want to squish one half of the face, the other one kind of has to complement it a little bit. It, it, if you try it at home, I, I know you're all going to do it, like when you come home, you're in the mirror, you're just going to look at yourself and try, you know, try that, all that stuff. So pushing through, pushing through, blinks, blinks, blinks. Really important because uh, eyes, the brain will perceive eyes as a focal point. So when it's like going over like your, your staging or whatever, it's going to hop between the eyes of the characters. So you can use the eyes to direct people, to like direct the focal point, do a lot of different stuff. Now, as I said before, this is in general terms, so I'm going to try to be kind of general. But this could easily be like a five-hour lecture just on this, uh, because there's a lot of different ways, like different reasons why a blink may deviate from a vanilla blink. But we're going to have to ignore that, you know? Like we're just going to have to power through and look at a vanilla blink. Vanilla is an awesome flavor, by the way. I, I don't like how they use that as a, like, a, oh, not flavored. But vanilla is a pretty decent flavor, like vanilla walk cycle. So here's, I, I kind of lied to Campbell about why I was recording him, because I wanted, uh, <laughs> I wanted a really good natural blink. And if you tell a subject that, oh, I'm going to record your blink, they're like, huh, OK, OK. Uh, <laughs> They're going to be really super focused on the thing, and you're not going to get a natural blink. So uh, this is even like he's probably got a couple of co cups of coffee in him. So it's, a, it's, a, it's like maybe two or three frames faster than it than it kind of maybe should be. <laughs> Consult your doctor. Yes. So um, if it uh, if I broke it down a little, we break it down a little bit. You see the first. Uh, oh, I have this thing here. Woo! Well, I'm very ready. So the f on the first frame. Uh, it's, that's just the starting position. And then there's just this slight little ante anticipation. Uh, it's not really like going anywhere. It's just this slight little anticipation before the big move. Now here's the first frame that actually moves at all. And then it's just starting slamming down and hitting really hard. If you just look at the overall thing, I mean, you can see that like here's, here's where the top eyelid is going all the way down. The first half is way quicker than the second half. That's because, and if you were to do it yourself and imagine it, imagine the top eyelid being really heavy. So it's like really easy to get, get it down, but it's kind of hard to pull it back up. And that's also why it like kind of tithers at the end. And this is a really important like cushioning at the end. Uh, I am kind of all uh, just focusing on the top eyelid because the lower one, and this is kind of being generous right here. Uh, the, wow, I'm ooh, all over the place. So the, the lower eyelid doesn't really come up that much. Uh, and depending on your animation style and everything, of course, that's going to be completely up to you. Now, if I try to mimic that, wow, that's a really bad resolution. But try to mimic that. And this is just with the eyelids. There's nothing else. I'm not animating anything else. This is just the normal vanilla blink, even a slightly faster. So here you can see the just a slight little difference between only animating the eyelids and then animating uh, just a little bit the flesh around the eyelids, just to make it feel a little bit more alive. And I, I'm sure you can't tell the de details, but even like the corners of the nose and mouth are coming slightly up. There's, there's a lot of tiny details there that keep it just slightly more alive. And because it's vanilla, it's not as profound, but if you're going to do some wacky bigger thing, then it's going to show up. And it's going to be completely dead if you just disconnect uh, that one muscle from everything. Now, here's how the professionals do it, of course. Um, this is even, the, like, I would say the, this is a little bit more relaxed than a vanilla, but I was just going through random trailers and, and grabbing whatever. 
You know, in trailers, they don't really like show somebody calm and blinking. It's like, ah, oh, action, oh, you know, <laughs> come into our movie. Yes. So I broke it down. And you can see that it's like, it's pretty much the same principles. It's going really fast down. Like there's a slight anticipation at the beginning, going slams right down. There's actually a kind of a cushioning thing going on where the eye, lower eyelid is coming up. The, the top one goes down and slams it down just a little bit, which is a cool effect. So here, when you break it down, it's pretty much what I, uh, what I explained. So I'm just going to go ahead and move on. So this is me replicating it a little bit. Um, now, it's roughly 15 frames, I would say, vanilla blink for a regular human, maybe like 12, 13 frames, kind of depends on the situation, a lot of factors. And here we see a lot of different blinks, all in the same, within the same frame. And they're slightly different, every single one of them, depending on the character, on the mood, on their motivation. But I'm only focusing on the main character there. Now his eyes, in this cartoon style, the, his eyes are huge, which means the, the eyelid has to travel way further. So you really, it's going to be really, uh, it's going to be more prominent. So this is me replicating it, and like I could have maybe opened the eye a little bit more in the beginning. But because it's like, it's super fast, and you can tell like it's going up, it's way faster than it maybe should be, but that's the style. And you, you have to kind of think of this as it's even going faster as it is because of the size of the eyes. So it's, it has to travel uh, a lot further. And now we got stuff, motion animation. And this is 24 frames per second. I'm so impressed. 24 frames per second. If you've ever tried stuff motion animation, 12 frames per second is a nightmare. <laughs> and like it's, it's straight ahead animation, which means it's not like you can like, do a little thing and then scroll back and fix things. It's just straight ahead. And if somebody hits your lamp, uh, start all over again. Like three days of work, all, all yeah, ruined. So this is really fast, super fast. And the way he goes down, there's no anticipation at all. It just starts from the resting position and then pops down. And it's seven frames total. So this is going to break the projector. This is everything next to each other. <laughs> the, in my head, this didn't look that creepy. And then, you know, it's like, wow, <laughs> OK. So you can see the, the, like the regular blink of uh, like a real one, then the Toy Story one, like the, from the Pixar, Sony Pictures Animation, and then uh, Paranorman from Leica. And you can see that like, there's similar pattern going on. It, they're not just like shutting it and opening it. Like, there's, there's similar patterns going on. And of course, they're breaking the rules to a certain degree. But there's something there that they're like mimicking from real life. This is, uh, I, I wanted to take this completely separately because I, I found this kind of fascinating. This is like old school animation, cell drawn animation. And these are animated on twos, which means that for every keyframe in 24 frames per second, uh, every keyframe holds for two frames, which is kind of insane. And it's also a double blink. So it's, it's like there. As I said before, like there are different variations. There's a half blink and a double blink and like all kinds of different variations. So just to show that there is something else different going on, this is on twos, 24 frames per second, and you can see that like this is kind of vastly different. So one of the things Disney does sometimes is um, double blink. By the way, is um, kind of a caricature of a more more feminine blink. So if you do a like it, it feels just slightly more feminine. Uh, not sure why, maybe it's a feedback loop, maybe we saw it so many times on, in cartoons or whatever. But when it goes down, it's having a hard time going over the iris. So it like starts going over the iris. You have to remember the iris was like, bul the pupil is bul bulging out of the eyeball a little bit. So it slows a little bit down and then pops back down. And uh, I've seen a lot of animators, like old school animators doing that. And even when it does that, sometimes they do one frame where the eye top eyelid is going down. And it pushes the pupil uh, a bit down. So it, like, it, it pushes it, uh, the character to look down for one frame and then comes back up normally. Uh, it's, it's a cool effect. Uh, I mean, it's not from real life, but it's like exaggerating a little bit what's going on in real life. OK, I'm not going to cover lip syncing because that became just, uh, that would have been five, six hours of talking about one subject. But I did record this, so I want to show you guys. 
And I did do one, uh, I, there, there was one mistake I did. Uh, so here is Campbell. And I mean, like, OK, you, you see the sentence. It's kind of nonsensical to a degree. But you see the P in pi and M in mom. So if you just look at it, pi, mom. So the whole ma sound, it's really pronounced. And like you can re it, it really sells that the audio and the video is syncing, and that, that character is talking. Now, what he's saying isn't this. That was a lie. What he's actually saying is this. Now, like, I, I took me a couple of hours, but I came up with a sentence that kind of made sense, but at the sa same exact mouth shapes. What I screwed up is, and that's why I kind of wanted to show you guys, so it has exactly the same mouth shapes on every single level, except for in Icelandic, uh, our V sounds are really soft, really, really soft. And in English, you have a really hard V sound. So uh, to me, the V here and the F here had exactly the same mouth shape. But then when I studied it a little bit further, I was like, nope, I'm doing it wrong. Yes, uh, my accent is killing it. A fairy could buy my girly box. Yeah, I, that had to happen. I'm sorry, Campbell. <laughs> so this is what I really want to talk about. Animation smears multiples. So uh, raise your hands who's heard of this before. Oh, like 25%, 30%, okay. okay, that's good, that's good. Okay, so they, so back in the day in old school cell-drawn animation, they used to fake motion blur because when stuff is happening so fast that the eye kind of can't perceive it, what should be happening is motion blur, but back in those days you couldn't have motion blur, so you had to just kind of fake it. And this is not seen by the eye, but it's perceived by the eye. So it's like you, it feels it, the viewer feels it, it doesn't really see it. And it's, it's the most fun thing ever. Your animation has to be actually good to begin with, and you have to know what you're doing to, to start doing this. You can't just willy-nilly, like, oh, everything's smearing. It gets kind of wacky. But it's, it's fascinating to see how, uh, like, even in modern cinema, you still see animation uh, studios trying to do this, like with a Lego movie. Like, you can see, like, there is multiple arms. But when he's doing it, you can't really perceive it. You just know that his arms, he doesn't have multiple arms. He has just two pairs of arms, like one pair of arms, and, and he's flinging them all over the, over the place. Um, so this was a tiny little demonstration I did yesterday because I thought it would uh, give me different results. This was kind of unexpected. So it, uh, let's say you have one ball, one red ball, and it's traveling from position one, two, and then three. I just placed three balls there to show the position because, you know. Uh, this is what I was expecting. The computer just kind of, uh, if you just uh, if you just rendered the, the number two position, by the way. This is what I was expecting. The computer kind of just averaging out and, and kind of predicting the future here. Like it's telling me what's going to happen in the future before it's happened. What I wanted was this. This is, this is closer to an animation smear. It's kind of more blurry. It, it doesn't predict the future, so if, some, if, if I'm going to animate somebody hitting some, something, and it's almost there, but like one frame before the impact, a motion blur starts on the subject that he's about to hit. That's giving away the joke. That's giving away what's about to happen, and then the, th the impact. And like as an animator, that's, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going frame by frame, spending all that time and effort into selling that hit and then the computer at the end kind of destroys it for me. That's, it's kind of sour. Uh, yeah, so that's what I was expecting Bunger to do. This is what he did. <laughs> I don't know what the hell is going on. And you know, I'm not complaining. I mean, I will happily just go frame by frame and blurring it myself. It's fine, but I don't, I, I don't understand what's going on. So this, like if I, if I render all these balls, this is what I get. Uh, by the way, pareidolia, that thing, if you see a, like a face in that, that's pareidolia. Duke, duke, nose, and a, yeah. All right, so animation smears and how I've used it. Uh, poor little guy. Um, there's a lot of effects going on, so there's a lot of like dust particles and fancy glowing stuff going on, and just a slight motion blur thing on top of everything. Uh, so I have like a play blast just to show you a little bit more 
better what's going on. I mean, it's still kind of, but it's a little bit better. So if I break it a bit down, you can see what I'm doing. It's the, uh, it's like the first Newton law or whatever, like an object will want to just stay in its position unless it's moved upon or whatever. So when I'm moving, like you're grabbing the body and you're moving it really fast, I'm delaying the head, so the head kind of wants to stay there. So I'm kind of stretching from where it used to be. Uh, it's just really fun. It's uh, so so much fun. But it goes by so fast. You spend like days doing this, and then oh oh, it came and went, and everybody oh you know, the story just continued. So yeah. So it's Halloween. If you guys were wondering about my uh, outfit. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> by the way, that that uh, that bust—it's Sintel. I was like, I had that idea of having—I mean, it's a it's, it's a fairly old joke. I mean, they've done it in Naked Gun and a lot of different places, but I just downloaded Sintel. It was missing the most important part, so I just—it's uh, midnight. So I might as well just. Creepy, weird, I know, but it's fine. Uh, so if you look at it again, and look that moment when he goes under the window. It's smeared, it's really smeared. Okay, now if I break that down a little bit, you can see what the hell is going on. And I'm just, like, I ricked that guy. And I didn't necessarily rick him to be able to do that, but when I did it, I, I was just grabbing whatever bone I could to try to make something smear and look like it's smearing. And there's no motion blur at all. There's no motion blur applied. And it's looking really cute here, like right at the end. Adorable. So uh, this is like one of the things I kind of want to leave with. Uh, the, the experience of learning a craft. Any craft, doesn't matter what, painting, animating, uh, wood carving, or whatever. Uh, there's a certain amount of experience. Like at the, in the beginning, you don't know anything. And then slowly and steadily, you become more experienced. You learn a little bit more. You read some books. You see some tutorials. And your confidence rises, of course, yes. But it's not going to be, it's going to be kind of jagged. Because you're going to have good days, bad days. You're going to get stuff, but not quite. And so, like, the level of confidence and expertise is going to slowly and steadily build up. So like, if we just took an average, slowly and steadily build up. That's not what humans do. This is what humans do. <laughs> this is called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And it's been well researched. Uh, they, it's, uh, they, they published this in 1999. Uh, they won the Ig Nobel Prize at 2000 because this was so hilarious. Uh, yeah, so you know nothing, and then you learn a little bit, and it's like, boom, confidence. <laughs> Just through the roof. And then you start learning a little bit more, and it's like, oh, I know nothing. <laughs> and you just break down, break down, break down. And then finally, at some point, you start building it up, but it never really reaches the peak that you started off with. Now, what I want to just emphasize with this is like, at least they, like, be aware of it. I mean, I'm totally guilty of this. Everybody's pretty much guilty of this. Uh, when you're going here, try to stay humble. And like, realize there's people that have been doing this before you, and they probably have something interesting to say and something you could learn from them. Um, and just try to curb your enthusiasm. Yes. I think that would be the expression, literally. Uh, and that way, when, when this fall, wow, I'm shaky. Here we go. When this fall starts, when the drop starts, you, can, you're like, you won't be as discouraged because you realize it's going to happen. That way, that, at least it's going to, yeah, the, the, the blow will be slightly milder. Uh, parting thoughts, yes. Uh, learn all this shit, read all the books, and, you know, and break the rules, of course, but like test it out and understand why the rules are there. OK, rules, kind of a harsh term. Principles, maybe, rules of thumb, something like that, you know. Uh, don't do that. I've done that when I was starting out. It was like, you know, you, you start making something, and it's kind of crappy, and it's like, oh, it's a style. <laughs> no, it's not. You have asked it. Uh, this is really important also. 
give, like learn how to give and take feedback. Of course, taking feedback is hard, and you have to learn it and all that stuff. Like, don't don't take it personally. It's not attacking you. It's just a, like it's just kind of. And also, they are like there's bad way to give feedback. Like, I hate it. It's 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 pathetic. Like, <laughs> thank you. Yes. I, like, wow. Not, from now on, I will be better. <laughs> no, it's not a good way. So giving feedback also helps you learn a lot because it helps you hone your, uh, like your skills of critiquing stuff. And when you're critiquing other people's stuff, that means you're you're not as dis like you're a little bit more disconnected to it, so you can see it like from a fresh perspective. That also helps when you're critiquing your own stuff, because that totally applies to your own work. You'll learn a lot from other people's mistakes. That's basically what I'm trying to say. Uh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Thing that all the stuff you're gonna do in the beginning are, it's gonna be shit. That's, I mean, that's just a given. That's in any craft. It's gonna be shit, but it's gonna be slowly and steadily a little bit better. And uh, there, I mean, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. It's just tunnels. <laughs> it's harsh, I know. When, when you look back, like two months, like uh, stuff I did two months ago, I'm like, that's shit. Like I could do it much better now. And then I strive for that. And then two months later, I'm like, that's shit. So it's just a given. You're going to go through the, that whole procedure. But don't think like, wow, I, I'll make it to like this level, and then I'm golden. Like, no, no, it's no. Uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, but it's good to have at least that mindset of like always striving for something better or whatnot. But just keep that in mind. Um, think a little bit about like the whole output input thing, uh, because if you're doing stuff that's so, like, oh, you guys are conformists, like you're not arty enough, like you want to, you're just copying Disney, like you you want to go way further outside the box, and then you start doing stuff that just doesn't make any sense and it's not going to be perceived by the viewer. That's I mean, that's like keeping your mind so open it falls out, you know. Uh, the <laughs> this craft is highly dependent on, like, unless you want to be that, that hermit dude uh, living in a cave just doing everything by yourself, it highly depends on other people giving you feedback, learning from them, and, and them learning from you. So, you know, try to not have an ego. So, like, I've seen studios that have, like, you know, all, uh, forsake all egos, like, as you walk through these doors or whatever. They phrase it better, I know. Uh, and, yeah, try to enjoy it. It's, it's not going to be enjoyable all the time. Uh, like you're going to have to, you know, miss maybe a party or a birthday or like any kind of thing that resembles a social life. But it's still, it's still fun. You know, it's, it's fun. It's fun. So yeah, that's it. Uh, questions. Questions. <laughs> Talked about books. Uh, can you recom uh, can you recommend one? Or yeah. Two? Okay. This is going to be a cliche, of course. But Illusion of Life by Frank and Ollie, uh, the the two of the old uh, nine old men from Disney. I highly recommend that. Just to give like the, it's more it's less about technique, more about like the history of the of um, the craft of animation. But it's a really good foundation to go from. That way you have at least an understanding when you go through the principles. Uh, uh, the Animator Survival uh, Survival Kit by Richard Williams is really good. And I highly recommend uh, going through 11 sec Second Club, going there and looking at the e-critiques, because they're, they're like maybe they, they take 20 minutes or an hour or whatever, but it's somebody from the field that's really good, like working at Pixar or Disney or whatever. And they're critiquing pretty much an amateur and seeing, like pointing out all the mistakes the amateur does, like positively, of course, and like, you know, um, making suggestions, what they could improve on. But just looking at that and learning from that, that's really helpful. I highly recommend that. Thank you. <laughs> now it's on the internet. <laughs> no! <laughs> I'm drinking apple juice. <laughs> um, like the last one, uh, the last clip in your performance. Uh, so
So I, mm, I don't do it personally, but I would highly recommend people do it. Uh, I don't do it personally because, like, I, I kind of did it with uh, with Eleven Second Club, and also with I uh, went through Animation Mentor uh, back in the day, and there was a lot of community going on there. But I. I do have like a number of people that I that are good friends of mine that are really skilled animators, so I can trust them and how to give me good feedback. So, but like if you're starting out and you don't have anybody like that, then it's still kind of good to get feedback from people. If you if you have friends that are assholes, just don't ignore that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Hi, anyone? Anything about the suit? Nothing. <laughs> Oh, yes. Herr Director. I never asked you, but have you ever worked with mocap, motion capture? No, no. But good question, though, regarding it overall. It, uh, I've heard, I've listened to a, I've listened to a lot of interviews uh, with like really experienced animators working on like Avatar and, and uh, just different types of stuff that requires motion capture. And the thing is, like, uh, the, the PR team for the, the studio wants to, well, not the studio, but the publisher, wants to kind of give that impression that, oh, it's all just recorded, and the animators barely have to do anything. And even like Andy Serkis, I'm looking at you on the internet, he's calling like animators working on his stuff, uh, digital makeup artists, and I've, I, I'm, uh, there, no way. Like, the, the thing is, the animators take that footage, and look at it as reference, like three-dimensional three reference, but it's still reference, and then start from scratch, and then make their own decisions. Now, there are some companies that, like, uh, like gaming companies, that kind of take the motion capture data and then just try to work with it a little bit and try to, like, do the best they can. But if it's high-end, uh, like, movie production, Hollywood production, they're going to look at it as reference. I know they did that with Avatar. Uh, I listened to an interview with a guy who was like, well, you know, I just like, oh, looked at it, oh, so nice. Set it to the side and started working. <laughs> <laughs> and like, and it didn't capture the face, like the, there was no thing for the face or anything. So he was like, yeah, I, I just looked at the footage and I like, you know, what would I do in that position? What's the character going through, his motivation? And, and just follow that, it's just basic principle of animation. For your, for your talk. Hello. Um, how can uh, 2D animation help us improve our 3D animation? Weird question. There we go. Sorry. How can, how can 2D animation uh, help us? With 3D animation? Yeah, oh, 3D animation. a lot, a lot. Um, so there kind of should be no difference at the, at the final output. You know what I mean? So it's, it's exactly the same principles. So the difference is you, like, what, what is helpful is that the consistency of the character is there because it's already um, a 3D rig. And you, like, when you're drawing, uh, it's, really, it's really hard to go through the model sheets and just make sure that the proportions of the head is always correct. You don't want to have this wacky move, but you still want to feel like it's still Donald Duck or whatever. With 3D, it has, has that consistency, but that freedom of doing something wacky gets kind of lost, especially if you have rigs that only allow certain certain things to happen. Uh, like that's why I, I kind of stopped having, um, I'm like clicking buttons in Blender doing this, uh, like limiting, limiting uh, rotation, limiting uh, scale or, or whatever, because you never know like when you come to that moment and you just want to break the arm just a little bit. It's only going to be for that one frame, but it's going to help out so much. Uh, so I have to like, you know, if I locked everything down, I have to go back to the, to the original character file, unlock lock everything. Uh, but treats, I mean, when you reach a certain level, you're, you're just kind of treating every frame as a painting, and you're cheating stuff towards the camera. So what should not happen is that you animate the stuff, and then you're like, wow, that animation is great. But like, I'm just going to move the camera on the other side. That, that doesn't work because you did everything like the silhouette is really clear like towards the camera and like a lot of cheating stuff like for example in ev any and every 3D movie uh, where I'm over here and the staging is always like I'm, I'm kind of facing you guys and there's an object like over there 
I'm not looking at it because if I'm looking at it, you're going to miss my face. So what they do is, I'm looking over there, my eyes are kind of looking over there, but you're going to kind of perceive it as I'm looking over there. So you're kind of cheating it. They have a really hard time when they're like the, the Disney and the Pixar folks are making these dolls, like Finding Nemo doll. And because they've been cheating the pupil so much, when you buy like a doll, it's like, wow, it looks nice from that one angle. And then all the other angles is like, oh, like really like cross-eyed and crazy. Uh, yeah, that, I, I feel sorry sometimes for the toy makers that have to be like, oh, yes, uh, I can make it happen, sure. Yeah. Thank yes. you. Um, do you think that your job as an animator will be different for stereoscopic 3D? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, stereoscopic 3D is awesome. It does put a lot of stress on the animator uh, because now he has to, like, kind of, when he's cheating stuff to the camera, yeah, you have to like okay. You have to remember, of course, to you know maintain the form in 3D. But sometimes, and I did it like a little bit with the with the agent dude. I mean, I was just breaking his arm and putting it in place. But that for that split second, it was fine. It's 2D. It's flat. But yeah, it, it does put a little bit more pressure on the animator to like cheat it. But look at it also in 3D and and make sure that the cheating thing isn't like popping or or doing something weird, the, the, like the arm isn't just going towards the camera and going back in one frame or whatever. Yeah. Yes. Would you recommend an acting class to an animator? Would I recommend an acting class to an animator? Yes, definitely. Uh, I myself, every now and then, go to like improv class uh, and like a free drawing class. I've only gone once, but I've, <laughs> I've gone, yes. I, I, I did attend, yeah. But yeah, yeah, it's it's highly recommended for any uh, animator to to go to acting classes, improv classes, drawing classes, uh, dancing, for example. Um, it they don't need to be good dancers or good actors or anything, but they need to understand the fundamentals of it. And if they want to do any kind of reference, which is which I highly recommend, because on that level, at least you have something to build upon, like something real to build upon. Uh, yeah, yes, go there. Yes. Uh, uh. Uh, uh. Okay. Uh, how long does it take to uh, make this kind of animation to uh, present it? Which one? <laughs> For it example, depends. the guy. Uh, oh, the agent dude. The dude. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Um, that took. Uh, so it was a little bit of a trial and error because I was rigging him and then animating and like ah oh, uh, there's weird stuff with the rig and I went back to fix it and then went. So there was a little bit of a back and forth, so it's kind of hard to cut it down. But I think maybe seven, eight days or something like that. And that's with the polish. Uh, the polish face takes a little bit. Like his thing here, like the skirt or whatever you call it. I don't know what you call it. Uh, that had to be like kind of hand animated frame by frame just to make, make sure that it was good enough. Because like doing the rig so it would like follow the thing and be really cool or whatever, that would have taken the same amount of time kind of. But you would still need to tweak it, so I was like, ah, I'll just go frame by frame and tweak it. <laughs> yes, and in in all this uh, frame by frame precision, I wanted to ask, how do you work with uh, particle simulations, for example, within the smoke generated uh, during the hitting very fast? Do you as well try to animate this, or is it just happen without? That, that was Andy. That was Andy. But Koralczyk. What up? You collaborate with him to uh, uh, you so, give well, him uh, some instructions what we were you on expect <laughs> from this smoke to happen, or you just leave it to him? And the, 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 so the deadline was insane when we were doing that. It was insane. It was the it was last Blender conference, and we were doing it while we were at the conference. It was insane. But uh, the only back and forth was that he added this awesome smoke and everything. And I was like, Andy, I spent all this time on the smears and we can't see them. So he like, okay, put, took them down a little bit. <laughs> I was like, thank you. <laughs> so that, 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 yeah, that was the extent of it. Uh, but yeah, I, I know what you mean. And uh, usually there's, uh, there's somebody kind of after me because I'm not a specialist in, in like effects or anything like that. There's somebody that will be behind me on the pipeline that will go through that, and I may maybe make 
some suggestions, like what I'm thinking about the scene, and then he'll come up with something and give feedback. But it's going to be a collaboration, definitely. Thank you. Yes, no worries. OK, fine. Thank you. <laughs> Yay.